You're welcome to session eight with me, um, Dr. Nikoi. Uh, this would be a continuation uh, of what we were looking at in session seven on population uh, characteristics, how to measure it, the uh, issues of uh, over and under population and the consequences of these for planning and development purposes. Uh, today we are interested in looking at world population distribution and key characteristics of uh, uh, population of a country. Um, our main uh, objectives for this session uh, is to describe the patterns of world population change. We also would uh, try to explain the factors underlying this uh, change and then describe the patterns of international and uh, internal um, movement uh, of the population. Now, the outline for this session, basically what we'll be doing is looking at the um, demographic transition model. Uh, we'll also look at population movements, which, are, which will include internal and international migration, and then we will summarize. The readings for this session, uh, you know, looks like a lot, but you know, if you read all of them, that would provide you with a broad overview and background uh, that will include even more than what I will be uh, describing to you today. So I will ask you to concentrate on uh, trying to read these things, chapter two, pages uh, 53 to 57 of Fulberg. Murphy, uh, de Blige, uh, Human Geography, People, Place, and Culture. And uh, you also have to, so uh, in addition to these uh, pages, uh, in chapter three, you would also find pages 76 to 86, uh, 98 uh, to 102. Um, and this will give you the full story for today's uh, uh, discussion. So what is the demographic transition? Um, throughout uh, the, the world, if you look broadly at uh, different populations, uh, what you realize is that uh, they have gone through a series of changes. Uh, if you look from the beginning of time uh, to the present, um, but what you also realize is that the rate at which these uh, uh, countries have gone through these changes uh, vary uh, from one place to the other, um, you know, depending on the, uh, the rate of economic uh, growth uh, and so many other factors. Now, the idea of a transition, demographic transition, uh, came from uh, Nostein in 1945. But it wasn't his original idea. Uh, he built upon uh, ideas put forward by uh, American uh, demographer uh, Warren Thompson, uh, who looking at over 200 years of changes in birth rates and death rates in mostly industrialized uh, nations, uh, developed this uh, model of modern demographic change. So basically what Nostein did was to refurbish uh, the ideas that Warren had put forward uh, way back in 1929. So the model itself, which is sometimes also uh, referred to as demographic transformation of population development model, uh, illustrates the dynamics in population growth uh, as societies you know, move from what we would consider as traditional uh, to what is referred to as modern. So it is how the population, the process of population change from a traditional to a more modernized or from, we'll say, a developing type country to a developed country. Now the model uh, proposes that as fertility uh, declines in uh, response to mortality declines, uh, there are structural changes uh, in the population uh, as it moves from a traditional to a more uh, modernized one. But this transformation occurs uh, on the linear. So it's, it, what it suggests is that uh, most societies would uh, 
go through the same process, uh, although it doesn't uh, say a whole lot about the timing of the, uh, of the change. So depending on uh, socioeconomic uh, circumstances, uh, different countries will go through these phases uh, at different times. Um, we have uh, a number of uh, stages, and depending on who you are uh, reading, uh, the, 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 the whole process of change from the uh, traditional to, to a more modernized society uh, can be grouped into either three stages uh, four stages, or even five stages. Uh, basically, this is how the model looks like uh, in terms of the gra uh, graphic representation. Um, in, in stage one, which is the high stationary uh, stage, uh, and we'll go through a much more detail uh, of these stages in subsequent slides, but the first stage usually coincides with a stage where you have high birth rates and high death rates. Uh, these are not constant rates. They spike and then ebb from time to time. But what is characteristic of this stage is that the death and birth rates are all very high. Uh, people die more. Uh, and so uh, the, the death and birth rates are high. Uh, but what we find with the um, total population is that you know, the birth and death rate seem to cross itself out. And so you have uh, what we call the natural increase, which uh, we mentioned earlier on, the difference between birth and death rates uh, will, will form the natural increase because uh, uh, both rates are high, they tend to cross this, uh, uh, each other out. And so the natural increase is also very small. Now, what factors motivate this uh, high uh, birth and death rates? Uh, you have, you know, if societies at this time need more children for farm work. And so um, they will give birth to a lot more. Um, Many will die as a consequence of the high mortality rate. And so uh, giving birth to a lot more would be the way to you know, at least maintain a stable um, farm supply of labor. And then you know, a lot of religious and, and social uh, groups encourage um, high births uh, at this time. And there's also no family planning. Uh, but those will basically be the reason for the high birth rate. And for the high death rate, we are looking at the, the rapid and uh, frequent occurrence of diseases, famine, uh, poor medical knowledge, all those things uh, contributing to the high uh, death rate. Now, if we come to stage two, which is our uh, early expanding uh, stage, we see a rapid, a very sharp decline in the death rate uh, but birth rate continues to be uh, quite high and, and changing, but much higher than the decline in, in death rate. And so uh, given what we know about the, the difference in these two, the natural increase uh, becomes much larger. Uh, and so uh, what we see is that in terms of total population, the addition of population to the world, uh, the size of the world's population uh, becomes also uh, expands really uh, uh, very fast. Uh, we can see uh, at this stage some of the reasons for the high birth rate uh, are about the same as those of the first stage. Um, but in the second stage, in terms of the reason for the decline in the death rate, we are seeing improvements in medical care, um, water supply and sanitation improvements, and also uh, fewer children dying as a result. Um, so uh, most, you know, in, in terms of countries that will be in the second stage, we are looking mostly at, you know, countries in Africa and most uh, developing countries. And then in the third stage, uh, which is late expanding, uh, what we realize is that a death rate continues to decline, uh, howbeit uh, at a slower rate, 
Um, and then uh, birth rate now begins to decline too. Uh, because uh, at this time, most families have begun to realize that their children are not going to die as often as uh, they thought they, they would die. And so uh, they have no incentive to keep producing more children. Uh, also, at this stage, you have some form of uh, industrialization taking place, urbanization taking place. And so uh, you have uh, things like taking care of children becoming more and more expensive, and also people wanting to enjoy uh, the new socioeconomic uh, developments that are uh, going on. And so producing more children uh, doesn't really become uh, important for them. Uh, we still have, for uh, the reasons for uh, declining uh, birth rate, we have uh, improved medical care, uh, fewer children needed for the farm, and also for you know, families to be able to take care of themselves. And um, uh, also we have, uh, for, for the reasons for the death rate decline, uh, still declining, uh, coming from the fact of improved uh, medical care and general improvement in diet. Uh, then we have in the fourth stage, the stage of low stationary, uh, countries like the United States, well-developed countries, um, and um, uh, most of what is happening here at this stage is people adoption of uh, family planning, uh, good health practices, uh, improving status of women, you know, women's employment, uh, education and all that are feeding into uh, families not wanting to have more children and even though what you will see is a gradual decline to a point where birth rates and death rates are uh, you know uh, coinciding still you realize that the um, total population is still increasing uh, basically because uh, what you find is that not all countries across the globe are in this fourth stage. And so even though the stage is not adding as much, the stages in uh, the, the countries in the first, second, and third stages are still uh, adding to the population. Now this fifth stage, uh, which is uh, a declining phase, uh, is a phase where it's believed that um, countries are no longer producing uh, or are not interested in having any more children. Uh, countries like Germany are typical of this stage. And it's mostly because um, the society has advanced to such an extent that, you know, having children becomes more burdensome. Uh, at, uh, countries like Germany and now have to mostly depend on uh, migrant populations to feed their um, industri industries and other um, development uh, uh, projects. Okay, so a, a lot of this uh, I've already covered. Uh, what you need to uh, add to uh, this to what I have already said uh, is uh, in actually the second uh, slide here, uh, which is that the occasional epidemics and famines uh, would dramatically increase crude uh, death rates for a few years. Okay, so this will happen for a long time uh, before the birth rate um, begins to kick in in terms of decline in the birth rate. Um, what we didn't add to the this, uh, description in the diagram that I showed earlier on uh, is the fact that the population mostly in the first, second stages are young and um, they also experience very low life expectancy. Um, they are also mostly agricultural subsistence, agricultural societies. Uh, and that is why they need more um, children to, f to be able to survive at this stage. Um, and in fact, throughout the history of uh, uh, human societies, uh, they have remained in this first stage for much longer than 
uh, the other faces that we are beginning to see. So in stage two, uh, we have also already talked about this, the fact that crude death rates continue to decline and um, as a result of improvement in medical science and also the fact that uh, birth rate be, uh, continues to remain high and so you have a big uh, natural increase uh, uh, in the process. Agriculture is still the backbone of this uh, type of uh, stage even though they are beginning to move gradually into the stage of uh, industrialization. In, in the third stage, which is the late expanding, um, as we have already uh, talked about, there is a rapid drop in the birth rate. Um, people are getting more educated. Uh, they are using contraception. Uh, and then there is also a more a decline need for children as socioeconomic conditions improve and urbanization kicks in. And so you have a, a death rate declining at this time, uh, but also birth rate declining. And so the natural increase is also uh, much more moderate uh, during this time. And as we have already noted, uh, countries like uh, China, Argentina, and Brazil uh, will fall in this uh, stage of the demographic transition model. The final stage, or the fourth stage, um, is also the low stationary. So what you, what you realize is that uh, this stage almost looked the same as stage one. They are all low and stationary, except that in stage one, you have high birth rate and high death rate canceling each other out to cause this low and stationary uh, a kind of uh, situation, but in the fourth stage, the low stationary is as a result of both low uh, birth and death rates. Um, the factors that motivate the, uh, this decline or low uh, birth and death rate are still family planning, good health, um, and also the fact that uh, people's general economic status uh, is improving. Uh, what we didn't add to the previous discussion is the fact that the, the population in the fourth stage is uh, more aged uh, than the, the previous uh, uh, stage one where you have much younger uh, population. And then life expectancy here uh, in stage four is also much longer uh, than in stage one. So what I have done in, in, in the last few minutes is contrast uh, uh, stage one uh, with stage four, uh, just so you know that even though they are both low and stationary, uh, there are differences uh, in what is going on over there. In stage five, uh, both birth and death rate continue to be low and then you have a population also declining. The, the growth in the population is, is declining uh, because total fertility is low. And as we mentioned earlier on Germany uh, and um, uh, Sweden uh, in this kind of stage. All right, so does this model apply to everybody? You know, if you look at it carefully, it is able to, uh, to a large extent, determine the path of different countries uh, in terms of the changes in the population. But it doesn't completely fit every country. Uh, remember that we said that the, the people who came up with this model, Nostein and Warren, uh, were living in developed countries. So their idea of the changes uh, came from their observation in this part of the world. And so that becomes one of the uh, major criticisms of the model, uh, the fact that it is Eurocentric and doesn't reflect a lot of what is going on in most Asian and African countries. It also has the problem of not being able to tell, you know, what level of modernization or economic development would characterize uh, 
uh, the transition from one stage to the other. So you, would, you wouldn't be able to say that, okay, if you achieve such uh, GDP, this level of GDP, then uh, you would have moved from stage one to stage two. And uh, what we see is that uh, Schneider and Schneider uh, and also Cardwell um, point to China and Sri Lanka as uh, a few examples that do not track the changes that uh, the demographic transition model seems to uh, propose. Because uh, they observe that uh, in these countries, uh, fertility declined uh, even though economic growth had not reached the levels that you would expect uh, in terms of the transition in the developed countries. Um, so uh, that would be uh, some of the uh, criticisms that we can level against um, the model. Uh, even more, uh, we can also see that uh, there is no time frame okay, in the model. Apart from the fact that it doesn't tell us how much economic development you have to achieve to move from one stage to the other, it doesn't take us, it tell us how long you have it has to take you to go from one uh, stage to, to the other. And in, in this uh, criticism, we can point to uh, countries like Malaysia and Korea uh, that you know, took just decades instead of the centuries that it took uh, European uh, countries to move from uh, stage one to the current uh, stage. So these are all part of the criticisms. Also the fact that the, the model doesn't take into account uh, issues like you know, um, traditional beliefs, uh, values, uh, that can also change uh, gradually and determine uh, uh, fertility rates. Uh, we, we mentioned that uh, uh, traditional values of uh, either early marriages, or you know the need for extended families. You know, as these things change with urbanization, uh, it affects the fertility rate of the societies. Uh, but the the, the model uh, doesn't seem to to point directly at these factors. It seems to have you know incorporated them in the background uh, to some extent. And then we have the, the, uh, the fact of uh, politics, okay? The government can institute a law that would uh, significantly impact uh, the fertility rate, for example. And China is uh, one example that we can uh, find for this. Okay, so, uh, so far, uh, combining session seven and what we have discussed in session eight, uh, I believe that it should be possible for you to be able to answer these questions. Uh, maybe a little bit uh, of what we'll, we'll say after this slide can also be helpful in answering uh, the second question about uh, rural urban migration uh, and the effects it has on source and destination regions. But at least up to this point, uh, you should be able to describe the causes and problems associated with high population growth rates in developing countries. All right, so let's talk about uh, population movement, which is uh, also captured by the word migration. You know, throughout time, uh, when you look at human societies, we have been on the move, okay? Uh, some voluntarily and others forced. So uh, we can talk even about hunter-gatherer societies uh, because they lived in an environment where they extracted resources from their immediate uh, surroundings. As these resources get depleted, they would have to move Okay, in this case, we might consider that a forced migration out of the lack of resources. But some other uh, movements have been motivated by, you know, uh, people wanting to seek better opportunities for themselves. And so uh, we can uh, 
uh, see a lot of movement going on, including even the slave trade. Um, what would we consider that to be? Is it forced or voluntary? That would be forced. Okay. The slave trade was a forced uh, movement uh, of people from uh, developing or African and or other Asian uh, countries into more developed uh, nations. So um, a migration uh, is just uh, the movement of people according to Carr 1990 uh, is a change, a movement of people from one place to another permanently. Now what we have to do uh, is to recognize that uh, there is a difference between uh, moving from your house to school Okay, on a daily basis or from your house to a shopping mall or to the market or to go and visit your friend, uh, there's a difference between that and what this uh, issue we are talking about, migration. Okay. Uh, migration is a permanent movement okay, to a new location. And um, we can classify uh, migration, we can have different types of migration based on uh, the distance covered, the course, and the time factor. Okay. So in terms of distance, uh, we can talk about internal migration um, in terms of, for example, uh, somebody moving from um, living in Labadi okay, to going to live in Medina. Uh, maybe your rent is due and you don't like your landlord, so you move from th that place to another place. Uh, it can, so it can be as small a distance as you know, moving from uh, Accra to Medina, or uh, uh, as much as moving from Accra to Kumasi. Okay. So uh, th that is uh, internal migration, but it's usually within the country. And then we can talk about migration uh, movement across international borders. Uh, we'll consider that external, and that, could, that would also uh, include what we'll call international migration. Okay. The interregional uh, migration uh, would involve something like moving from the greater Accra region to Ashanti region. Okay. Or it could also sometimes uh, imply moving from West Africa, which is considered a region, to South Africa or Southern Africa. So um, these all, all of these uh, involve uh, distances, and that is how we are able to classify this type of migration. Uh, causation, in terms of causation, we've already talked about forced um, situations of political instability. We saw that in Liberia and, and some of these uh, Somalia and all these places. Uh, we have refugees from Chad. Um, so uh, these are all forced. Uh, it's not only a refugee situation uh, in, in terms of political instability. It could also be as a result of flooding. Of your, uh, of your village or where you're living, or it could be the result of farming. Um, and then the, uh, the other cause is uh, economic motivation. Okay? You're living in a place, you don't have any economic opportunities, you can find a job, you, you don't see any improvement in your life, and so you look at the other side, you think the grass is greener on that side, and then you move over there. Uh, that is an uh, economically motivated type of migration. And then we can also talk about seasonal migration um, in which sometimes you see um, a northern uh, farmers from the northern region come to cocoa uh, uh, areas in the middle belt to come and farm. After the season is over, they go back and go and stay in their, uh, in their place of origin until the next season or move to another place where they can find another crop uh, growing in its season. And then we, we have temporary um, migrations, uh, people seeking asylum in another country until the situation in their country uh, gets stabilized and then they can return. 
uh, th th this kind of uh, migrants are found a lot in uh, in the United States. There were um, Somalis living in the United States uh, as asylum seekers uh, just because of uh, the, the war situation in their country. And then you have a permanent move in which people go and never return. Okay. Uh, so in terms of time scale, this is how we would um, uh, char characterize this kind of migration. Okay. Now, so if you look at what Carr says about uh, permanent migration, uh, the same set of factors are seen here. Uh, the cause of the move being either voluntary or, or involuntary. Uh, distances covered being either over international, uh, uh, inter over national boundaries uh, or internal movements, and then um, a, a movement from either urban to rural or rural to urban uh, types of uh, migration. But we can also talk about uh, migration uh, by looking at uh, this term immigration and emigration. Okay. Emigration being the move from the, the place where you are, okay, and then the immigration is going to the place of, of your destination. Now the difference between the two of these uh, types of migration, uh, just like the uh, birth, and, uh, fertility, uh, birth and death rate, uh, is what will give us the net, uh, that's the difference, the net migration. So some of it, apart from the, the causes that we have talked about, um, uh, these are some categories of uh, main causes for people uh, moving from one place to another. The economic factor, searching for a job, um, whether internal or external, uh, looking for a job could motivate uh, the movement uh, from one place to, to the other. And also uh, social factors. Uh, people, uh, some of you students here, uh, would, have been, would have gotten here from wherever you are just because of your education. And so you would, in some ways, be considered uh, migrants. Some of you come to live here and never go back. Okay, and then there is uh, the movement based on, you know, either uh, forced by uh, political persecution or religious persecution. Um, and a lot of people that have gone to the United States and Western Europe have claimed this as, uh, sometimes it can all even be uh, cultural persecution. Uh, I know of uh, cases where uh, some women claimed uh, genital mutilation as uh, a reason for wanting to uh, be considered as migrants in uh, some developed countries. And then we have the environmental uh, based on uh, drought farming and you know, some volcanic eruptions. All these things can displace people and cause them to move from where they live to a new location. Okay, so now we would uh, look more closely at uh, internal migration. Uh, with this, we have, you know, uh, rural to urban, which is the more emphasized type of my internal migration. But we also have rural to rural migrations, which uh, don't get as much visibility. Uh, and then urban to rural, and then urban to urban. Okay. Now, rural to urban, uh, usually uh, we have uh, usually poor people uh, forced by some circumstance, um, which we'll look at later on, um, to migrate from uh, rural settings to uh, more uh, developed urban uh, areas. Uh, rural to rural mostly is engaged in by farmers you know, uh, moving from one farm area to another farm area uh, just because of depletion of uh, resources in, 
in their, their own place of residence uh, so that they can seek more farmlands to uh, practice agriculture. And also we, we have uh, urban to rural, a situation where um, sometimes people are fed up with uh, urban lifestyle. You know, the, the pressure, the hustle, you know, the lack of space, the overcrowding um, can motivate them to want to leave the urban place and find more space uh, to live the kind of lifestyle they want to live. Uh, this is more prevalent in uh, developed countries uh, where people move from you know, city centers to more of uh, the uh, rural or uh, suburban areas. Uh, th this is usually uh, helped by the fact that you know, there is improved transportation um, and so people can move from even these uh, rural places into town to just come and engage in some economic activities and then go back. Uh, urban to urban uh, usually is engaged in by um, you know, people that are engaged in business. Um, and so uh, this type of uh, uh, change you know, occurs a lot. Uh, people moving from Accra to go and work in Cape Coast or being transferred from one uh, region to the other. So what are some of the causes of uh, internal migration? Uh, we have, uh, we can group this, uh, the causes into push and pull factors. Uh, some of the push factors, uh, particularly with reference to rural to urban migration, uh, is land shortages. So uh, you can look about, uh, at a situation in which uh, your father has four children uh, and uh, his father gave him, let's say, five, uh, four uh, plots of land, okay? Now, if he gives these uh, four plots of land to his four children and his four children also have four children each, then each of them will have to divide their one plot into four plots. So over a long generation, uh, what you realize is that the available land for farming uh, would decline per head. And therefore, if uh, uh, people feel that they can't find places to farm anymore, then they would, they'll be forced to move to find new lands to, to farm on um, or to, to move to the urban areas to come and seek uh, different opportunities there. Then we have unemployment um, as farmlands declined, as the fertility of the, of the, of the uh, land declines and uh, the youth feel that they, don't find, they can't find employment in agriculture or agro-industries. Uh, they are forced to come into uh, urban areas to come and look for uh, some informal or formal jobs uh, to be able to survive. Uh, we can see a lot of these people uh, on our street today. Uh, you know, those selling the mentors and, um, uh, you know, the phone cards on the streets or dog chains. Um, a lot of them are the, uh, the victims of uh, rural to urban uh, migration. Then we can also have poverty and crop failure. Uh, maybe it's not that uh, you don't have land available to you, uh, but in a particular year like we had in Ghana in 1983 where there was massive drought, uh, if your, your farm is not yielding enough to feed the family, then you are forced to uh, move uh, into urban areas uh, to find another means of, uh, of livelihood. Uh, poverty uh, is mostly rampant in rural areas. Uh, they have no access to electricity, uh, no access to water, no access to good schools. Um, even though uh, nowadays we can say that a is experiencing the same things, uh, except that we don't have anywhere else to move. Um, and then there is also the lack of social amenities that uh, go along with poverty, uh, particularly in rural areas. Uh, schools are mostly confined or there's a lot more good schools in uh, urban areas 
done in um, uh, rural areas. Um, uh, good, all the good hospitals, the uh, more modernized facilities are all in urban areas. And so uh, those, uh, if you have a loved one that is sick and needs uh, an operation, uh, then uh, you are forced to uh, sometimes migrate to the urban area to seek for uh, such uh, um, medical help. And then uh, lack of educational opportunities. Um, a lot of uh, uh, you students here, if you had a good university in the place that you were, you probably would have no reason to come to the University of Ghana. Uh, and so uh, lack of uh, educational opportunities, uh, if, you, if your child is going to school sitting under a tree, uh, there are no teachers in the, in the, uh, in the place where you are, uh, or good doctors, uh, then all these things will motivate uh, some people to want to move. Um, and then some people also move uh, trying to run away from uh, cultural practices. We've already mentioned uh, female genital mutilation, but sometimes it's uh, a 15-year-old or a 14-year-old being forced to uh, marry early. Uh, all these things can impact uh, a people's decision to want to uh, migrate from rural areas. So if something is causing people to move from the rural areas, there must be an attractive force uh, that is uh, uh, pulling them to the urban uh, areas. And it's mostly because of uh, the idea that, you know, if you come and work in an urban area, you might earn more wages. And sometimes, you know, people come to urban places, uh, come and engage in all kinds of menial jobs, uh, still are able to raise a little more money and go back to their village. And then everybody sees them and they are like, oh, you're looking good. It must be good over there. Okay. And then they want to also come and join them. In, um, but there is a higher tendency to find a job in an urban environment doing all kinds of things than in a rural uh, environment. And so that is uh, one of the things that pulls people. And also the fact that if you are in an urban area, a lot of things are possible. Okay. And so uh, that can be a motivating factor for wanting to come to an urban uh, a place. And there is also the idea of the social attraction. Um, the extent to which uh, this might be a reason to pull uh, rural people uh, is not clear. But you know, in a lot of uh, uh, rural places where there is no electricity, okay, uh, the ability to enjoy a lot of this uh, type of facility in an urban place uh, can be attractive enough. You know, if you are in a rural area and uh, you have just learned how to, um, you know, sew uh, from apprenticeship and there is no power for you to, you know, start your own uh, a business, then uh, maybe coming to the urban place might be your best choice. Now, what are some of the effects of migration? Uh, it, in terms of this, we can talk about uh, the benefits to uh, the place of origination of the migration uh, or the immigrating place. Uh, we can talk of the fact that you know, when people migrate, uh, they are sometimes able to engage in productive economic activities, uh, save enough uh, to send money back home. And so uh, what it does is that uh, it sends uh, resources, economic resources, financial resources uh, to people who otherwise not have those resources. And so it's able to improve the well-being of some of the, of the people at home. If you can't uh, you know, buy cutlasses or farming inputs and your son in the city can send you a few CDs, uh, that can make a difference uh, for you in terms of your, uh, your own economic uh, activities back home. Um, sometimes people will send clothes, uh, they will send food, and that can be helpful. Also, migrants, um, 
you know that people that leave uh, some of these rural areas to urban uh, places are able to acquire new skills you know you come to the urban environment you see what people are doing uh, and sometimes you are able to you know engage in some of them and in in the process uh, get new skills that you can take back home and go and improve your own well-being and there is also you know, we talked earlier on about, you know, a dwindling uh, a land for farming. And so uh, once people move from these uh, rural areas, uh, they are able to then reduce the pressure on the lands that would be available for farming. And so uh, other siblings can have bigger lands to farm on uh, because uh, some of them would have moved and they wouldn't have need for uh, their agricultural lands and there is also the fact that you know as more and more people move from a place the pressure on employment is also reduced there will be fewer people going after uh, job opportunities and therefore the chance for for them to be able to find uh, employment and there is also the idea of uh, a reduction in the pressure on social amenities okay if a small hospital uh, is taking care of 500 people and let's say even a hundred of these people move away from this neighborhood or this community then uh, the um, uh, health worker to uh, patient ratios are reduced and um, more, more and more people can be taken care of uh, school uh, classroom sizes the, the number of people in a classroom would also decline enough for children to have more attention from, um, from teachers, for example. But so what are the uh, disadvantages to the source regions? We have seen what the advantage is, reduction on pressure on land, uh, you know, pre uh, pressure on employment uh, declines, decline on social amenities. But there are some disadvantages too, uh, including the fact of a shortage of labor. You know, in a lot of uh, uh, cases, uh, those who migrate from rural uh, agricultural uh, societies uh, are the young people. And so if they move away uh, from these places, then it will be very difficult to find able bodies to engage in agricultural activities. And so that can impact productivity and therefore uh, socioeconomic improvement in these places. Uh, there is also uh, the fact of a reduction in the size of the market. Okay? If 20 people are living in a place and five leaves, then you only have 15 people to sell things to. And so uh, what happens is that uh, that can have a knock-on effect on you know, people's ability to produce more, increase their productivity, and that can have a, a negative effect on the market available. Uh, the, 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 this last point here uh, tracks with the first point of labor shortage. Uh, in agricultural societies, if more and more people move from these societies, then you have fewer hands working on the fields, uh, which will mean that uh, they would not be able to produce enough, and that can impact uh, uh, food, food uh, availability. Uh, uh, keep in mind that the rural areas uh, usually don't produce just for themselves, they produce also for the urban uh, uh, communities, and therefore if, if there is a labor shortage in rural areas, that can Im impact food supply also in the urban area. Now, in terms of the destination, the urban areas, uh, what would be some of the benefits and disadvantage? Um, this would include things like cheap labor. The more people there are in an urban environment, like we have here in Accra, uh, the cheaper their labor. Now, you can hire some a mason uh, who is not finding a lot of uh, uh, opportunities for cheap uh, than in some other uh, places where uh, you know the population is small and so there's a higher demand for these uh, masons and so 
the advantage to urban places or places of uh, immigration is that they get a lot more people and therefore labor becomes cheap. Uh, the market size also increases because there are more people. If there is an industry, it can produce more goods and services because the, the people will be available to uh, absorb the products. Um, there is also increased productivity as a result. Uh, just like I just said, the more people there are, the more people you can, uh, the more commodities you can produce for them to absorb. And so that would increase your productivity. Now with uh, increased productivity comes increased revenue. The more you can sell, the more income you receive, and the more you can expand whatever productive activity you are engaged in. The disadvantage though, uh, and we have seen a lot of this in uh, session seven, uh, pressure on, on housing and um, other health facilities. There will be overcrowding, uh, congestion, and um, the creation of slum situation. And then we have the degradation of the environment and increase in uh, social vices. As long as there are a lot of people um, and their labor is cheap, they wouldn't be able to earn enough. And you know, if the urban uh, environment is too harsh for them in terms of the prices of commodities and services, then sometimes some are forced to engage in vice, uh, social vices to uh, stay alive. So what about international migration? I mean, most of the factors that we have talked about in terms of the uh, factors motivating the movement of people internally also apply to international or external movements. Um, a lot of people uh, always see developed advanced countries as places of economic opportunity, places where they can find good jobs, even if they are cleaning, uh, a lot of the times they feel that the amount of income they will earn from doing that is way more than if they were in their own country. Uh, so some have done uh, the movement legally and others have done that uh, illegally. Uh, education is another reason why people migrate. You know, a lot of the time people finish first degree and you know, they, uh, the next thing they are thinking about is their master's or PhD. And a lot of Ghanaians and a lot of people from developing nations uh, travel to uh, the United States, Europe, um, and other developed places uh, just to seek uh, educational opportunities. And then there is the fact of uh, political conflicts in developing countries, which has also become one of the reasons why people migrate. Uh, I remember when the Liberian War happened, um, the United States opened its door for a lot of uh, Liberians to be able to apply and come in. And uh, I, like I said before, we have a lot of uh, Somalis um, in the United States. Now, because of uh, the problem of uh, immigration in some of these developed countries, they have had to put uh, a lot of uh, tight controls on, their, on who is coming in and how many should come in at a time. You know, it used to be that uh, they came in, you know, taking people forcefully uh, back into their countries to go and work on their plantations. Uh, now they have developed to a point where they don't need just about anybody. Um, the United States, for example, have uh, this guest worker program uh, where they would allow a number of people, particularly Mexicans and other South Americans, to come in um, basically to work in their farms. And uh, there is also the United States lottery uh, this one is uh, supposed to uh, bring in uh, legal migrants, uh, 55,000 every year uh, to the United States. 
And uh, for them, that is a, a much better way of controlling who is coming in, how, how, how many these people are, uh, so that they can know how to plan uh, for uh, these people. So in effect, what we have been uh, looking at in this session uh, has been the demographic transition model, uh, the, the fact that it attempts to explain the process of population change over a long period of time. Um, but we've have, we have also seen that not all countries go through the same, uh, you know, the same process and the rates of uh, the population change from one country to the other can be different. Uh, we have seen the fact that there are problems with the model itself in terms of what is lacking and uh, what it's, it's counting that uh, does not exist across the, the globe. Uh, we have also seen the factors that motivate the change and also looked at uh, migration, uh, both internal and external migration, the push and pull factors, um, and all that uh, all, that it, uh, all the things that uh, motivate people to move from one place to, to the other. Without any questions, I will end here and see you in the next session. Thank you. <laughs>